So, uh, after spending like over an hour trying to set up these wonderful multi-camera angles, you know, to get a perfect recording of this event, we've just discovered some unexpected um, network traffic control features of the Kiln network that made it so we couldn't talk to the cameras. So next time I'm going to bring an access point, uh, a router of my own to kind of bypass those issues. Um, so that we can have an awesome streaming and recording and whatever. Uh, but for right now, I am just recording on this little crappy $5 microphone and just my laptop view. Um, couldn't get it, the rest of the stuff working in time. And funnily enough, as we were setting things up, the one camera I could connect to was like that one, <laughs> <laughs> which wasn't even supposed to work. I'm not even sure how that happened, but... Um, those are just, the luck, that's the luck of the draw, I guess. Um, but it's really great to be with you guys. I am Carl Youngblood. Um, I have been involved with blockchain ever since I discovered the Bitcoin white paper back in 2010. And um, since 2017, I've been working full time in the space. Most recently at AWS as a blockchain specialist, I was in charge of solutions architecture for their Amazon managed blockchain service. And I left AWS at the end of May and um, I have been just kind of working on my own blockchain projects since then. And I'm really like, there was a time when, I mean, not that I'm not busy, but I was so busy I felt like I had to kind of drop the meetup group. But, but I had been organizing the meetup group um, a few year, a couple years ago. And I would like to start this up again. This is kind of like our second debut, I guess. Um, and I'm hoping to have monthly meetups uh, from here on out. And I'd really like to grow the blockchain ecosystem here in Utah. We now have quite a few blockchain companies in the area. We've got folks from Genesis Block here. Thanks for coming, guys. Um, we've also got uh, DeFiQ. Um, and yeah, I don't know if you're not exactly working for them, but you're, remind yeah. me your name again? Richard. Richard. Um, but they are actually sponsoring, I think they're sponsoring the food here. Uh, I haven't been, I haven't gotten a response lately, but I'm about to send the receipts to them, so we'll see. <laughs> anyway, the idea is every um, month we're going to try to have a different blockchain company in the area. We also are being sponsored by Silicon Slopes crypto chapter and Boston McClary over there in the corner is uh, in charge of them and we're really grateful for their sponsorship and by Kiln who's sponsoring the venue for free. Um, so thank you Kiln. And um, we really want to involve all the blockchain companies. The way I feel is, you know, you every maybe six months will rotate the responsibility for, for the food. We will um, give you guys a chance to come up here tell us about your company, tell us if you're hiring and the kind of things you're looking for, and even um, present and share the things that you guys are doing. Um, and what I really want this to become is not a place where you get the latest token tips on what to buy, okay? <laughs> this is for serious kind of developers. It doesn't matter if you have no prior exposure to blockchain development or if you're um, more experienced. But the point is that we're going to be building together and we're going to be sharing our, um, our learnings together. So uh, it's not the kind of place where you're going to get a high or bad, I should say bad signal to noise ratio because I never know if it's high or low or it's good. But anyway, um, you, should ha you should be able to come here and, and learn something and share something as well. So today um, I prepared uh, some, uh, a tutorial on building your own decentralized application or DAP. And um, Do you think you have slides? Yeah, uh, yes. Let me see. I, it thinks it's on, but maybe the TV turned off. OK. Oh, yeah, there we go. Um, OK, cool. Hopefully, that'll stay on now. Um, all right, and <clears throat> this um, tutorial that I prepared today is actually um, 
something I put together a couple years ago and presented at reInvent, um, which is like the big conference that AWS does every year. Or I can't remember if we skipped a year at COVID, but anyway. Um, well, no, we, we, we streamed something. Anyway. Um, <clears throat> and when I built this originally, I did it with Truffle. Um, but since then, um, I think the new hotness is um, this thing called hard hat, all right? So um, the way I'm going to show you this today is um, with hard hat. And I think, uh, you know, but as I was kind of updating my project to work with hard hat, um, there's, you know, one of the things that I discovered was my, my entire front end, I needed to kind of update it. Um, it was kind of a weird situation because if I had had an old version of MetaMask, I could have made my app still work. But because I didn't want to try to hunt down an old version of MetaMask, the more recent versions of MetaMask require that your app obtain permission from MetaMask before it shares your wallet info. And, um, and so updating MetaMask then meant that my versions of Drizzle and other Truffle stuff that I was using were out of date. And it was just this kind of like dependency hell. And so I'm just rebuilding the app kind of from scratch with hard hat. And I'll kind of walk you through that today and we'll, we'll see how far we get. But I suspect what we'll be doing is I'll be coming back and doing part two of this uh, next month where um, what we'll do today is we'll probably focus on this, the building of a smart contract and just the beginnings of connecting your smart contract to a web interface, okay? And then, and then I'll kind of like keep going um, next time. And I'm hoping that as, you know, that this will like inspire you guys to think of what you might want to share with the group as well, because we're always going to be looking for um, tips and tricks and stuff like that. But I really want to be building really cool things. Um, and then, you know, this is just the beginning. So. Uh, I figured we could start with a topic that kind of everybody who's going to be building on blockchain needs to know, or, or at least should kind of become familiar with, and then we can get fancier, you know, because there are lots of things, you know, after you've got, say, a basic blockchain application working, um, you often run into things like, okay, well, wait, how do we scale this application? How do we improve the user experience so that when someone you know, submits their transaction, they aren't just like freaked out, sweating bullets, waiting for to see if that transaction actually goes through. How robust is our error checking and the kind of stuff to make sure that the DAP experience is as good as it possibly can be. And as you know, that is like a really, I would say generally it's kind of bad right now. Um, I don't know if you guys remember this. Um, let me see if I can find this. It used to be that when you, you, you might be too um, young for this, <laughs> but when you first, when, like, when the internet was just getting started, in order to even connect to the internet, you had to have a TCP IP stack, right? Like it didn't come with Windows, right? And so you had to put in all these numbers into this thing called Trumpet Windsock. And nobody knew what this was for. Everyone was just like, okay, all I know is you have to put the floppy for Trumpet Winsock. I was going to say you have to download Trumpet Winsock, but they didn't have downloads back then. So, or they kind of did, but you have to set it up first. So anyway, you had to set this up and you had to put all these numbers in and no one knew what was going on. And I kind of feel like right now we're in those days with blockchain where you have to set up this thing called MetaMask on your browser and no one exactly, you know, a lot of people get confused with some of the things that you have to set up for it. Um, but MetaMask, is there a question? <laughs> oh, yeah. I, don't you wish? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Make sure you don't click on any ads for MetaMask. Yeah, yeah, you can, um, yeah, there, there's all sorts of exotic um, hacks as well for like getting people to give away their, their funds, right? So um, what we're going to do today, though, is 
we're going to be working exclusively on my own machine. And um, we're going to start out with hard hat. But just know that in order to interact with blockchain applications, you typically are going to need to install uh, an extension called MetaMask in your Chrome. And by the way, I was, I was just um, talking to some folks about like what level of prior knowledge you might need for our session today. And basically, my approach is I know a lot of you know about MetaMask already, but I'm just going to briefly explain what things are for folks who maybe aren't as familiar with blockchain development. I'll try not to waste too much of the time of the guys who are more experienced here. But MetaMask is that kind of extension that essentially exposes um, your wallet to the dApp in a careful and controlled way so that you can um, approve transactions. Um, and MetaMask can work with either um, a software wallet or with a hardware wallet. And you know, one of these days I can bring with me some of those hardware wallets, just give you an idea for what those are like. The hardware wallet just adds a slight additional layer of security where you have to type a PIN number with every transaction <laughs> that you do. Um, it's more, definitely more secure um, and is generally a good idea, but you know, when you have to use it for every single transaction that you want to approve, it can be a little bit cumbersome, but so it's kind of a trade-off between sort of security and convenience there. But what we're going to do here is in my MetaMask, um, and hopefully that's big enough. I know that this bigger screen is kind of like for years, I think it's been broken. Hopefully they'll fix it soon. Um, the um, So, uh, I, and I could maybe try to bump up my, you know, if I bump up my resolution, it will probably mess up the recording. So I'm just going to leave it the way it is. Can you, are you guys okay with uh, this? I can, I can basically zoom in. But basically, um, what we want to do with MetaMask is we want to select a different network, and we're going to select local host here. And um, it just so happens that I am running. I'm going to bump up the font here because I definitely can do that. Um, I am running a hard hat session here, and I'm just going to kind of break out of this and kind of start from scratch to show you guys what, what we're going to do here today. So, got my web storm. So we're going to start out by you. We're going to be in a, a Node.js development environment, and I like to use Node Version Manager or NVM. So I'm going to, um, I've already set that up on my machine and I'm just going to use NVM um, latest version 114. Uh, and I am going to then, um, the next thing we want to do, if you haven't already done it, is, uh, I guess I can't um, copy and paste. That's going to be annoying. I guess I can just grab it over here. It's fine. a little bigger. So we're going to install hard hat. You know, and actually, I'm going to go to a brand new folder just so you can kind of see this, what this is like from scratch here. So um, we will call this my first dap. And we will go. I think I need to go npm init actually set up the dap with basic settings and then install hard hat and one of the first things i'm going to do is run this npx hard hat function which will set up in my um, it will just set up a basic sample project. And I am just going to put it right here and install the project dependencies and let it do that thing. Um, and what Hardhack gives you is it gives you like um, 
a local network that you can use that will essentially simulate an Ethereum network on your local machine. And it also gives you 20 accounts, each with 10,000 Ether in them. <laughs> Except it's only in your own little kingdom, you know? It's like no one else recognizes the legitimacy of this kingdom, right? So, but it does, it is plenty of funds to play around with while you're testing your applications and stuff like that. Um, and I'm sure you probably can could figure it for like even more money if you really wanted to feel, I don't know if that <laughs> gets you excited. Um, and uh, so at it, when you set that up, another thing that it does for you is it um, will create these, it will give you the, um, let's see, I'm going to run the network. So npx hard hat, and I think that's just run. Um, start. No, node. <coughs> okay. So <coughs> npx hard hat node runs that local network, and you can see it's got all these different accounts, and it gives you the address of each account and this private key. So I'm going to go into my MetaMask now, and I'm going to tell MetaMask about this account. I click on this section here in my accounts, and I'm going to say import account and paste that private key right in there. Oh, actually, um, I had already set up that account because basically every time you call MetaMask, it you, it creates this same set of accounts for you, just kind of keep things simple, so you're not constantly setting up new things. So it's already connected um, to that account, and I could add more if I wanted to. Um, funnily enough, I guess some people forget to change some things on their local configuration when they deploy, and they sometimes send real money to these accounts here, and everyone is like, don't do that because there are people who are constantly like vultures who are just flying around waiting for actual money to show up in there in those places and then transfer it over to their own wallets, right? Because essentially these private keys will work with re the, the live main Ethereum network. Um, but of course, everybody knows the keys, so the first person to see those funds gets them, basically. Um, so don't don't make that mistake. Um, so we're, we've connected to this account, and we've got ten thousand ether. And now, um, the next thing we're going to do is we're gonna this this um, sample hard hat project comes with a little example network and I'm gonna in my other um, folder here just shrink the window a bit I'm gonna go to that folder and I'm gonna go npx hard hat build uh, just a second compile so that compiled this little sample contract that they gave me and if I type uh, test it actually goes and compiles those that smart contra contract and runs a simple unit test for the smart contract. So if we go and look at what's in there, I'm going to open this up. Let's see if I can open it up in WebStorm. Um, all right, so if we go to contracts, you see this... Um, let me make this bigger. This little simple smart contract that they um, have created for us, right? And <coughs> it's it's 
it's written in a language called Solidity. And Solidity is the smart contract programming language that was first invented by Ethereum. Um, and this actually compiles down to a type of bytecode that is read and understood by the Ethereum uh, virtual machines, the Ethereum nodes that are on the Ethereum network. And you could use another language to, um, to write your smart contracts in. In fact, there, are, there is more than just Solidity. There is a language called Viper, which is slightly more Python looking. Um, and there's, I think, others. And then there are even folks who sometimes will try to optimize certain functions in assembly language. Um, and so it's funny, like, I don't know uh, how many CS gra graduates are here, but when I was doing the CS program at BYU and University of Washington, we actually had to take a class where they taught us assembly language, and we had to co you know, do some bit twiddling and cool little efficiency techniques. And we were thinking, like, when are we ever going to use this, you know? Um, but crazily enough, um, it's like everything old is new again, right? Um, uh, they're now, because of how expensive and how, you know, even if it's not that expensive, like doing it a million times becomes expensive, uh, how these, these transactions end up, you want to shave off all of the cost you can, you know? Um, and so uh, some people are actually doing optimization with assembly in their, in their smart contracts. Um, and in fact, the other day I learned that the, some of the standards that are emerging in this space, like the ERC-20 standard, has some methods on it that are not even needed, but that are just used by convention because that's the way it kind of got started. And um, they're saying that like billions of dollars a year is being wa is, are being wasted, you know, just because um, of these extra methods that are getting called every time you transfer Ether from or any token from one uh, ERC-20 contract, you know. So anyway, interesting stuff. Um, so, but what I'm going to do today is I'm actually going to bring in a contract that I've already written. Um, and I've got that waiting right here. And the uh, app that I'm, that I'm um, building here is going to be for a, a set of polls. Um, and so let me just create this file, polls.sol, for Solidity. Um, I guess we'll just treat it as text. <laughs> and so I'll, I'll just give you guys a quick run through of what this, this does. But the basic idea of this is, um, and since we got started about half an hour late, I'm gonna, planning on going at least till 1.30. Um, obviously, if you need to leave earlier, um, feel free to do so. Um, but anyway, the idea here is I wanted to create a DAP that wouldn't just be a single user interacting with it, but that would be several users interacting with each other and posting data that, that one another could modify and edit and change. So I thought, let's create one of those polls like they have on Facebook where someone says, Do you, what's your favorite color, red, green, or blue? And you click on the red, and it like increases the vote count on that one by one and you see how many people voted for one versus the other versus the other, right? And then when we're all done with this, um, I will be sharing my network over ngrok with you guys so that you could actually configure your MetaMask to talk to my network, and you could each get one of those 19 accounts, or not each of you, but 19 of you could get one of those accounts, or 20 accounts, um, and connect and create your own polls and we could like be responding to each other's polls, okay? So if this goes as planned, eventually we'll get there. Um, but uh, you can see that I've created some data structures that are necessary for this uh, contract to function. So each poll will have a title and the title can be up to 32 characters. Um, you can create longer um, longer text than 32 characters um, using a different uh, data type, but 
it's just a little more um, challenging to work with. So most of my strings, I'm just confining to 32 characters for the purposes of the demo. But you can see how there's this string type here. And that can just be, um, uh, you know, like an arbitrary amount of text. Now, every single byte that you want to store takes up space in a smart contract somewhere and is ultimately taking space on the blockchain. And, and while it hasn't been resolved yet, the question of space rent is an important question that a lot of people are debating right now. Because really, if you think about it, um, pushing data onto the blockchain means that you're obligating all the nodes on the blockchain right now to store that data in perpetuity. And the idea is like everyone's just taking that for granted and assuming that there's this infinite amount of space. But as we all know, uh, it's pretty hard to run a node already. Um, Doug, you've had to do that in the past. And yeah, no. Oh, do you do you yeah. run them with um, AWS or do we you? Have AWS and we have uh, other yeah, yeah, and so it's like terabytes and terabytes, and it gets pretty annoying to try to maintain it. And some some you know instance classes and um, services don't even support like the the disk I/O that you need to be able to do that. And so it can be a bit of a challenge. Yeah, Scott. Just a quick question: How much storage are you using for Node right now? So, yeah. so you used to be able to like spin it up on like a maxed out Mac Mini, and it's it's not really practical. So on your AWS instances, instances, are you in the terabytes at this point? So th I don't actually have to configure because AWS makes it so easy. Frozen. Then I just I just use their default configuration, and so I think you run two instances there, and then there's another node service that we spin up as well. But it is terabytes, yeah. Yeah. Um, and uh, and yeah the. I worked closely with the service team that built the, the service there, and they, they have ways of essentially replicating a shared um, a, sh a shared uh, copy of the blockchain to a new s instance every time it spins up. Okay. <coughs> um, and some services are even getting fancier and providing uh, kind of like caching of the blockchain data so that each node isn't running its own, like um, its own copy, but instead it's kind of like Redis or something, where the um, the data for the blockchain is more easy to access. Um, those are kind of hard though, because you got to make sure that all of the same transactions that the node is used to reading can can um, work with that abstraction layer, and so it's it's pretty complex. Um, and then caching results can have determinism problems and other things like that. So anyway, it's it's a challenge. Um, so we've got with each with each poll we have a title, we have a question like what's your favorite color. We have a number of options that are stored with that, and I'm keeping a count so that I always know how many I want to iterate over if I need to list all the options that are available. Then we have a vote count that shows you the total of number of people who voted for that poll so that you can basically calculate how many of the total voted for each option, right? Then I have an array of strings for each option. And then I have um, a, the amount of votes that each option got. And then I have an address uh, that's a, a mapping between addresses and numbers, which just basically keeps track of who has voted. So in um, Ethereum, every every the only way to interact with a, a smart contract is through a wallet, and every wallet has an address associated with it. Um, so if you think you're anonymous on the blockchain, you actually aren't completely anonymous. There's a string of bits that's associated with you. And it can often be, you can correlate that data over all the activity of, that someone has and, and discover a lot of, about a person. Um, and then some uh, companies even do a form of KYC, or know your customer, which will map your actual identity to those bits. 
uh, because maybe they're required to do that for regulatory purposes or other things like that. So um, it's best to assume that you know you 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 can be traced on the blockchain, or at least just be careful when you're you know interacting with it. Um, then we have um, the owner is the person who created the poll, and um, I can't remember what I was doing with index, but um, I've got functions for creating a poll, functions for retrieving a poll. Now, any function that modifies data in your smart contract is going to cost what's called gas. Gas is just a small amount of ether, um, and it it basically is used with every transaction that you submit to the blockchain that modifies something. Um, that The purpose of that is to prevent someone from consuming the resources of the blockchain network um, because it's, it's, a, it's a, essentially a commons area. It's an area that's shared by everyone. And if we want to make sure that um, it doesn't get destroyed to where nobody can get anything done, we have to charge for each little thing that someone wants to do. And if someone makes a mistake of like making an inefficient contract or one that's stuck in a loop or something, it can drain all their funds pretty quickly. Um, but when we, so when we create a new poll, for example, we would incur a fee for doing that. But anything that's just retrieving data in a read-only fashion, like this method here, get poll, um, that's essentially free to call because your node already has a copy of the entire blockchain data. So you just call the method and it, it retrieves the data from local um, information. Uh, then there are other methods for um, various things like checking if something exists, um, adding a new option to an existing poll. So the, the way you create a poll right now is you create the poll first and then you add options to it one by one. So one of the things we will experience as we go through this DAP is we'll get a feel for how what the process is like to create um, to do a multi-process uh, multi-step um, interaction with a, a blockchain and this is actually really useful because there are a lot of um, you know staking and other kinds of um, other kinds of smart contracts out there that you might want to build for like if you're building a, a DAO or a blockchain protocol of your own. And there'll often be a two-step process where you like first have to approve um, uh, yourself as like allow being allowed to interact with this uh, contract. And then you have another step that's like to stake your funds or whatever it is that you want to do. And so from the user's perspective, we don't want the user to get stuck in limbo where they like have done the first step but not the second step. And those kinds of things can be challenging to program. So we'll get a feel for what it's like to do a multi-step process, um, keep the user informed along the way, and kind of um, make sure that you know, they're given the right spinner when they're waiting for something to happen. And if you know, they did bail before the whole process completes, that we could at least show them sort of where they are in that multi-step process. That's really important, and frankly, right now it's still not working that well. I've, um, you know, interacted with some of those more famous DeFi applications like uh, the Curve, some of the Curve pools, and didn't realize that I had only done the first process and not the second one. So my funds were just sitting there for like months, not earning any, any, um, you know, interest or fees or rewards, and. <laughs> At least I could get them out, <laughs> but like um, I didn't. I didn't realize that um, it wasn't. I didn't finish the whole process, right? And that's really clunky, to be honest. Like right now, that whole experience in DeFi could still use a lot of work. So, um, and Doug probably knows the feeling of what that's like. So, um, he's he's working on some DeFi stuff right now. Um, so anyway, uh, we'll work on some of that. But let me now pull up my. Um, my tests so that we can see what those are like. Um, I have prepared some unit tests. And I will paste these into the tests here. And we will take a look at those.
So I think I saved both of them, yeah. Cool. All right, so let's look at some of the things we're checking in these tests. Now, um, some of you might be like super hardcore test-driven development kind of folks, and some of you might not be. But one thing I can say is like, you might not need to write tests in lots of different contexts, but one context when you absolutely, positively, never should not write tests is when you're testing your smart contracts. And the reason for that is that um, this is a domain where real funds are consumed whenever somebody is calling your methods and where despite your best intentions, you can still have lots of flaws and bugs. And whenever you're launching a real DAP for public consumption um, that is involving any significant funds, um, you should be probably paying uh, some professionals to help you audit that. And that can easily start at over 50 grand or more to, to pay for an audit. Um, but it's one, something I recommend most startups do if they are building uh, a smart contract. And, um, and even then, you know, you can, there, you can miss things. And so it, it's really vital that you at least cover all your bases with your unit tests. One other thing that I do want to do um, in, our, in future meetups is I have some friends and associates that actually are called in when other people's smart contracts get hacked and they can share with us tips about like some of the things to watch out for and some of the ways that contracts get exploited out there. And so I look forward to maybe um, having a presentation here um, in the future where we talk about some of that stuff. Uh, but it's really kind of um, unexpected in that like um, there, there are things that even if your code looks totally fine, you may just not be aware of some of the conventions in this space that that might potentially cause your stuff to have problems. Uh, keep in mind that all of this stuff is permissionless and composable. So um, you are calling other people's contracts and other contracts are calling yours. And so for example, um, a lot of people make the assumption that an ERC-20 contract, uh, when you call a transfer method on an ERC-20 contract, that that will just transfer the funds when you request it to do so. But actually, um, that method could do whatever it wants to, and it could actually throw an error. So everybody's transfer method does something different, and they can code it to do whatever they want. And um, some, of the, some of the token contracts out there actually have a block list in them. So they, they have something, a list of accounts that they don't want to allow to transfer funds or other things like that. And you need to make sure that when you're writing your contracts that interact with other people's contracts, that they respond to all those potential failure scenarios. So that's just one example of how you might think that you're doing everything right according to your code, but you're a part of a larger ecosystem and you just want to make sure that you've thought of everything that could go wrong, right? All right, so um, I'm testing whether a user can create a new poll I'm also making sure that one user can't modify another user's poll, um, that they can retrieve all a list of all the polls, that they can view a recently created poll, um, that they get an error if they look for a poll that's not there. Um, they can add an option to a poll that they own. They can get a count. They can check specific options. Um, they get an error if one of the options they look for isn't there. Um, edit things, uh, basically everything that I could think of of like how you want to interact with these, this thing. Yeah? Is there a way to execute like some separate zone tests? Um, I think there is actually. Um, I haven't looked into that too closely, but I do think there are some tools for that. And one tool that I also um, would love to kind of, uh, not that I'm a pro on it, but I can study it and share my findings. but. Um, there are tools for just uh, common, like linter, linting tools for uh, contracts that show you just common um, things that you shouldn't do, right? They, they test for re-entrancy bugs and other things like that. So um, yeah, so we can, I would love for anybody to, 
present one. In fact, we should make a list of like things we want to learn, right? And just have um, share the load of like the homework studying, and and we can each you know share our findings with each other and kind of make everyone smarter that way. So um, so just to give you an example of what these tests look like, um, I'm going to bounce into a few of these here. Um, so I have here this you know I'm using a kind of mocha like syntax with the describes the nested describes um, and also a little utility called chai that just allows you to use certain syntax things um, and then one of the main things I'm using is this ethers library ethers.js which allows me to just run some common um, ethereum inter, you know um, methods and one, one um, helper method I have in here is called assert poll modified event. So I ended up checking to see if a poll was modified so many times, checking for this event, that I took this test, this part of my test and made a method for, for checking that. So whenever I call um, a, a smart contract method that modifies something, I check to make sure that that event was emitted and I fail if, if it wasn't. Um, at the beginning of every one of my tests, I retrieve two different accounts from the uh, system. This is the creator and the respondent. So like I'm testing both if the creator can do things, but also have this other account to test to make sure that it can respond to polls, but it can't modify the existing things. And then um, this is just an example test here. I'm trying to create a poll. I first generate the title, the owner um, name, the question. I do have this feature where I, I'm storing a name of the owner of the poll just to make the UI a little bit more friendly. But obviously, you know, the person would have to disclose what their name was if they wanted to, to do that. Um, in, in the DAP that I've built, I've just like randomly assigning names like Alice, Bob, and Carol to, um, to the users who connect. Um, and then um, we check to see that the poll count is as expected. We attempt to call a method on the contract and um, check to see that the modified event got emitted. Now, one thing you might wonder, like some people, um, their testing philosophy is like, well, I've got all this repeated boilerplate code in my test, and, I, and the next test down is doing lots of the same things as the, as the one before it. Should I try to dry up that code and reduce the duplication? And my advice is, um, while it's good to reduce code duplication, generally speaking, when you're writing tests, it's probably the one time when it's not a good idea. And that's because I feel that each test should be self-contained where you can look at a test and you can see everything that's happening um, just in that test on its own. And um, nothing that you modify in one test is going to like break all the other ones. Um, so I generally I I encourage people to reduce the amount of, or to um, leave, it, leave some level of duplication so that each test is fairly independent of each other. Um, so anyway, um, and you can kind of see how we just um, in, in some of these other tests, we're just you know calling these methods and, and testing for certain things. So that gives you a feel for yeah, Scott. Yeah. So I am not doing anything that like would test. Um, you know, limits of how much you could possibly store or something like that. Um, I would think of those almost as maybe stress testing over unit testing, personally. Um, and frankly, right now, if someone can afford to <laughs> create 40 million polls or whatever, more power to them. You know, I, I, um, it's probably not as big of a concern. But, you know, to be honest, this uh, DAP is probably it's not the way you would probably build um, this particular functionality. You wouldn't probably implement a poll system on a blockchain this way, just because it would be kind of costly to do it, right? Um, 
but it, it just serves a purpose. It's an instructional yeah, purpose, yeah. right? Yeah, exactly. Um, all right, so now that I've got that um, those tests passing, let's let's look at the next thing we want to check out here. Just a minute. So um, we're now going to start creating the front end application. So I'm in my DAP here, and I'm going to use a tool that you guys probably have heard of already called Create React App, um, or at least some of you. Um, and so we'll be using React for this. And I will just um, do the install for setting up Create React App. And we'll just get the very beginning of this done, and then we'll kind of wrap it up for today. And I'll plan on doing a part two of this where I show you how to connect your front end to, um, to your, your smart contract and interact with the network. Um, and we're going to be using for this, we're going to use a tool or a framework um, called UseDAP. I don't know if you, have you guys heard of that? Um, so there is a pretty cool YouTube video. Let me just see if I can find it. Actually, I think I've got it open still. Well, it's this one right here. I would definitely recommend this. Um, it's like 16 hours and 22 minutes long. Um, uh, <laughs> but hey, it's you could do it all in one day if you really wanted to. <laughs> um, let me. I can post this. Um, actually, I'll, I'll. I'll just post it right now. Oh, except that I got to log in. I hate that. Let's see. Discussions. <laughs> I've, I've, I've got a lot of faith. <laughs> All right, so um, I just posted that on the meetup. I think this is a is worth checking out. But he also shares use DAP and how to use Hard Hat in this one. Um, and UseDAP is great because it uses the same um, kind of, the same new, I even forget the right terminology for it, but the new way that React is d doing stuff with hooks. hooks. Yeah, hooks, that's right. Um, it, it creates hooks for all of your smart contract stuff. So you can basically have these um, state variables that you're watching, and whenever um, something changes in your smart contract, the state of the co contract is automatically updated in your local component, and things just show up in the right places. You know, so it's um, it is quite nice to be able to use hooks to to build your your DApps. Um, all right, so let me go back to where we were. All right, so we've got that. We're going to create the front end. Oh, I did that already, I guess. Maybe not. Um, NPM, create React app, front end. Oh, sorry. NPX. Maybe I should fix that. Come on.
Yeah, so I am recording just the screen that I'm showing you guys right now, plus my audio, sort of. <laughs> um, and uh, yeah, I'll, I'll put that up. Um, and then hopefully next time we'll have, you know, we'll be able to actually use these system, the system that I brought here. Um, all right, so we've just generated the front end. And we'll go inside of there. And we're going to install some dependencies. Uh, these first ones are just some, some of the things that we are going to include require these. Um, and then we're going to install that usedap framework that I mentioned earlier. And then I like this um, system called Tailwind CSS. Um, and so all of these commands here help to set that up. Thanks for coming, guys. All right. Um, so now that we've got that set up, we can go into the front end. We can run npx. Run, actually, run start. Okay. So I just started up our React app that we just barely created. And of course, there's nothing there. Um, so what we're going to do here is um, we, we are just going to copy a few things into various config files that sort of tell it how to connect to our local network. And then um, if all goes well, we will have like the ability to essentially connect to MetaMask as soon as I'm done here. Um, it may take five or ten minutes more um, to get to that point. And I know that we're, you know, it's been an hour and a half since our official starting time. So um, we could, I could keep going, or if you guys want, we could, like, start there at our next session. I mean, how, how are people feeling as far as how much time they've got left? I know this is technically supposed to be lunch, right? So. <laughs> Yeah, let's do a poll. <laughs> By show of hands, um, how many people would like to just paw, like stop here and our, do our part two next month um, from where we left off? Yeah, I mean, how much time do we have left in this one? Uh, I mean, I, well, as far as I have m a lot more than that, oh, okay. so <laughs> so that would still it would still be to be continued regardless. Okay. Uh, yeah, it looks like the general consensus is that we we break we adjourn here. But hey, I want to thank you guys so much for coming out. And um, please continue to like connect with each other. And please reach out to me if you have something to share with the group, because I really want this to be a collaborative thing where we grow the blockchain ecosystem here in Utah. Thanks, guys. Yeah.